Everyone, Koa here of KNFS, where we anglers are always learning, sharing knowledge about fishing and fishes, and today we're going to talk about the northern sunfish, that's right. We're going to go over some fishing tips, identification tricks, even get into this species lineage, uh, past history. And I'm at the Potomac River, Virginia side today, that's Maryland over there, and this river is actually relevant to the northern sunfish. We've always been led to believe there are long ear in here, but that's not quite the case. You'll learn why later on. Alright, got some dinner in me and I'm good to go. So we can't talk about the northern sunfish today without talking about the long ear species complex and I have some very cool developments on that. So let's change up the style of this Lepamid video and get into fishing tips uh, before we get into the lineage and identification tips. Maybe this is a species you need to check off of your life list, so I believe we can help you do that today. But I suppose the best fishing tip to give any angler, veteran, or not is just to tell you where to find this species, so we'll cover range and habitat right now. Lepimus peltastes, the northern sunfish, is only found in North America. Populations exist within the Surrey Red Rainy Basin, within the southwestern parts of Ontario and into Minnesota. There are small but established populations in the eastern parts of Wisconsin and down into Illinois. This species is most commonly found in the Great Lakes Basin starting in Ohio, but most abundant getting into Michigan and the southern parts of Ontario. There is also a small population of northern sunfish in the Lake Champlain watershed. This is likely a resurgence of the indigenous population rather than an anthropogenic introduction or a human introduction. And if you're in Montreal, keep an eye out. There may still be some northern around that area. Here's an approximation of a more expanded range where northern may have been in the last couple hundred years. I haven't seen or read of any northern sunfish caught in these purple areas within recent decades, as most likely these populations are extirpated, uh, probably because of industry and agriculture, sediment getting into pollution into the water. A lot of that area is pretty much in the heart of the Corn Belt runoff right there. Habitat wise, this species can be found in lakes, creeks, uh, small to medium rivers. It will more than likely be found in abundance in clearer water because as we just mentioned, this species doesn't thrive in sediment laden water too well. The northern sunfish has a preference for a rocky or sandy bottom. It's been shown in southern Michigan that clear water lakes with exposed marl sediment are more likely to hold northern sunfish in abundance compared to lakes with purely dense vegetation along the entire bottom, where in those highly vegetated lakes, the northern sunfish is absent or rarely found. So keep an eye out for those marl benches and lakes. And here, just inland of the Georgian Bay in southern Ontario, Dustin Bocek, who works with the Natural Resource Department up there, provided us with some great photos of nesting specimens. In his observation, he's found that Northern sunfish uh, love the transition spots between soft substrate and hard substrate like uh, riprap, boulders, and cobble where they can easily find cover for hiding spots. He likens the northern sunfish to rock bass and notes that these two species will hang out together and that's a behavior I have seen as well in the states. He added and I quote, I feel like those that chase northerns would be blown away by where they hang out up here and how numerous they can be. Which only makes me want to go to Canada more and not just to fish for musky lunch. Uh, in creeks and rivers, find the calm pools or slow moving water where there's some sort of cover nearby. One of my favorite places to find northern sunfish is in the scattered vegetation along shorelines of rivers and creeks. Uh, like this spot on the Kankakee River in Illinois. This is a a shoreline with a lot of scattered rocks and intermittent patches of tall macrophytes or those aquatic plants that create nice hiding spots. These plants also create uh, calm pockets of water where the sunfishes can just sit near the bottom and not exert much energy, yet still be able to quickly nab any food bits being passed along by the current. And here's a great tip. If you start pulling up three to five inch bluegill or pumpkin seed in an area that might have northern sunfish, keep fishing that spot for northern sunfish. I've seen these three species shoal together on multiple occasions in multiple different states. 
Uh, keep in mind that the northern sunfish usually won't exceed much past 5 inches or about 13 centimeters. So that's why you're looking for those similarly sized specimens of the other common sunfishes. In this spot I must have pulled up 10 bluegill before I started getting northern sunfish specimens. In my experience, bluegill are far more aggressive to baits than pretty much any other lepamid. So sifting through a few bluegill is worth it to get to your northern sunfish. This here is a creek in northern Illinois and it's not the clearest of water at all times because sediment kicks up so easily and gets uh, drained in there from the surrounding agriculture. So even though the northern don't thrive in sediment laden water, like I said before, it doesn't mean they can't tolerate it for some durations. Uh, the populations just don't seem to be too big. For example, we can remember those northern sunfish I pulled in northern Ohio when I went on the fishing trip for the KNFS movie The 13. That was very turbid water where I pulled those northerns out of. They were sitting in the only emergent vegetation I could find along the shore. But here at this creek in Illinois, I was fishing atop this log pile and pulling uh, bluegill, shiners, and crappie from the adjacent deep pool. But I just felt the logs right underneath of me were perfect for northern sunfish to be hanging out. The logs offered a lot of cover with little nooks for three to five inch fish, as well as being in shallow water, only about two feet deep. So I stuck the camera in the water under a log and went off to fish about a half mile down the creek. When I checked the video later, look who happened to show up with a pair of bluegill. A northern sunfish, right where I thought it would be, hanging out with a different species, but all about the same size. I didn't catch that specimen though, but I definitely caught a few northern sunfish along that half mile stretch in similar calm shallow pools near cover. You can't see it, but there's a sunken log right in the middle of this pool that this northern was hanging around. In southeastern Wisconsin, I checked out a clear water outlet flowing out of a lake looking for northern and orange spotted sunfish, but I was pulling up bluegill, warmouth rock bass, and pumpkin seed, and no northern. So I moved to a shallower part of the creek looking for smaller shoaling lepimids. And I saw a group with three to five inch specimens that looked like pumpkin seed or northern sunfish. So I herded that group into some cover to fish them out. And it is really hard to tell pumpkin seed and northerns apart when you're just looking down on them and they're darting around. So it's worth fishing them out to find out what they are. So I just fished this group out and picked off a couple pumpkin seeds first before getting some northern sunfish out of that group. So let's just talk about a couple bait options that I like. This northern was caught on a size 18 tungsten zebra midge red by Umpqua. I love using little bead head flies for small lepimids. I would almost classify this type of fishing uh, for northerns as a type of micro fishing because it's a small species and as you can tell I'm not using a fly rod setup and that can offer some disadvantages when using such light lures like the sacrifice of casting distance and as we know being closer to the fish means we're more likely to spook that fish but lepimids or the common sunfishes are sort of convenient like that compared to some other species like some of the salmonids or uh, some suckers lepimids will spook for sure and get to cover but once you settle into a spot and stop moving around they'll settle down within seconds and start hitting the baits in front of them and if you don't have a fly rod, that's totally fine. My preference is actually a six foot rod with a spinning reel. And you can add a split shot to your line just to add some weight and get some more casting distance. It, it, it doesn't need to be pretty. And most of the time for the smaller species, I don't need to cast far because I'm just finessing around cover. Often, I'm not even casting. I'm just dropping my bait in the water with precision drops around the cover and maybe doing a little light flipping. Then it's just about twitching the bait to give it some life. A study on the feeding habits of summertime northern sunfish adults in lakes showed that they primarily were eating the larvae of dragonflies, mayflies, as well as amphipods. So you can go ahead and uh, adjust your flies that way if you want. Definitely those triple tail mayflies or you can harvest your own. Another bait option that'll work very well is just to use a hook and a shred of worm. It's a golden ticket. I'd say the ideal hook size for targeting northern sunfish is between a size 18 and 14. This northern sunfish in Michigan was caught on a size 18 downward eye umpqua hook with a bit of worm. 
And this species has been described in some publications as a lion weight predator, sort of like the warmouth. It'll sit low near the benthic and pick off its prey. Hookwise, again, I'd say don't go bigger than a size 10. There's really no need. Um, most brands, their size 8 and 6 is really too big for most adult specimens of northern sunfish. You'll miss out on catching a lot of those adult specimens. But, I mean, if you're only going after a future PB northern sunfish, a size 10 or 8 will work. But really, I'm guessing you're an experienced angler, so just use your instincts. Maybe just go a bit smaller on those bait sizes if you've been going too big. You know where to find the northern sunfish now, and that's the hardest part. If you can just figure out where they are and then have the patience to work a spot for a while, then you'll probably land your northern and cross that species off your life list. And of course, I encourage you to share your experiences with northern sunfish or fishing tips down in the uh, comments below, just like we do on all the KNFS videos. But now let's get into the lineage of the northern sunfish. Of which this lineage is one of the youngest uh, species out of all the common sunfishes, ranging back maybe as early as 2.6 million years ago. And of course, we can't talk about the northern sunfish without talking about the long ear species complex because for a couple hundred years or so, scientists have been trying to figure out how to classify all the various populations of fishes within the long ear species complex, including the populations of what we now call the northern sunfish. I mean, between the early 1800s and early 1900s, there were at least 17 different proposed species that synonymized with the long ear sunfish. And in the last 100 years, it's been a hot mess trying to sort out what should be considered subspecies or even a new species. And in the 1800s, Cope is credited with describing Lepimus peltastes as a species in a publication. But jumping ahead more than 100 years, up until about 20 years ago, the northern sunfish was broadly considered as a subspecies of Lepimus megalotus, uh, the long ear sunfish. But in 2004, a species atlas published by Bailey et al. elevated the northern sunfish to a species status. And these authors, as I understand it, just sort of published this species elevation without proper peer-reviewed discussion or genetic data to support it. They figured the morphological and behavioral differences from the other fishes within the complex was sufficient justification for that species elevation. And their reasoning made sense, but that's just not how taxonomic and systematic changes should go about. They evaded a lot of protocols for uh, how you go about elevating species to a species status. But as the years went on, a few other ichthyologists just kind of went with it in their future publications, and then it was commonly accepted by other scientists and anglers that the northern sunfish was its own species apart from the long ear sunfish complex. And sometime last year I got my hands on the early version of what I consider to be a groundbreaking study pertaining to this long ear sunfish complex. And I believe it was officially published in March of this year, but this study by Kim Bauer-Nier uses morphological, genetic, and phylogeographic evidence to support the hypothesis that the Lepimus megalotus complex does indeed have six distinct lineages, where two of those six lineages are the northern sunfish in the north and what would remain named as the long ear sunfish in the central part of that range. This study is suggesting that the four remaining lineages should be elevated to species status. There's Lepimus aquilensis in the southwest and Lepimus solist in the southeast. And really this study insinuates that these two species are already valid species as they were both already described as distinct species back in the 1800s. But within most all ichthyological publications of recent decades, these two lineages have been considered only as synonyms of Lepimus megalotus and not as distinct species. The remaining two lineages are Lepimus washita in a very small range in southeastern Oklahoma and southwestern Arkansas, pretty much localized to the Little River tributary and the uh, Kiamachi River. And then there's the Lepimus ozark having a bit bigger range starting in the west part of the Ozark Highlands region and extending west and south of that. According to a couple of this study's phylogenetic analyses, the northern sunfish may be most closely related to what they describe as Lepimus ozark, then Lepimus megalotus, the longer sunfish, then the remaining lineages, while there remains no argument that the dollar sunfish, uh, Lepimus marginatus, is indeed a sister species most 
closely related just outside that complex. And there seems to be no doubt under all the genetic and morphological analyses that the northern sunfish should remain as a distinct species. What's also very important about this study is that they further revealed with their genetic and morphological analyses just how complicated these lineages are. As far as past introgressions and current hybridizations go, a good number of these populations, though mostly localized, have been swapping DNA at certain points in their evolution, most likely due to secondary contact or uh, certain hybridization events. Hence why I mentioned the Potomac River in the intro. This study pulled the genetics on two specimens from the upper Potomac River basin, and the genetics show this population is a genetic mixture of northern and long ear sunfishes. So most likely, all of these supposed long ear in the Potomac River are genetic admixtures of northern sunfish and long ear sunfish. But I cannot say that with 100% certainty without seeing far more genetic analyses of species within the basin, especially the southern part. However, knowing about this genetic admixture really makes sense with how the Potomac population appears. Every specimen I've pulled out of the Potomac River or seen observations of just never seemed pure long ear to me. Like this one, you can really see the northern sunfish features most easily just on that ear flap by the extra slanting and by the patterning and coloration. But we'll talk more on this as we move along. And this past introgression between the northern sunfish and long ear sunfish goes beyond the Potomac River drainage basin. Basically, if we keep looking at the populations of long ear sunfish extending from West Virginia and into Ohio and into Kentucky and into Tennessee and into Illinois, they are mostly showing genetically admixed specimens with the northern sunfish. Now, we can probably thank glaciers for this past genetic admixture and what we see in these populations today. Technically, we live in an ice age. For the last 2.5 million years or so, glaciers have been expanding and retreating here in North America. And it was only about, what, 20-ish thousand years ago to where a big sheet of ice was covering what is now most of Canada, as well as a good chunk of the U.S. And these glaciers really shaped the landscape. They created many thousands of lakes and they created new river drainages and altered existing ones. For example, while that last giant ice sheet was retreating and melting, the moraines crumbled holding Lake Chicago, the ancestor lake of what is now Lake Michigan. This was described as a catastrophic flood because so much water and debris washed down the drainage, reshaping a vast area of land. There's plenty of cool, very apparent evidence of this flood at Starved Rock State Park in Illinois. And now the Illinois River and the Kankakee River and their drainages are largely shaped by the past effects of this recent catastrophic flood. And this flood even changed drainages well farther south along the Mississippi River. And that last big retreating glacier was affecting drainages all over the place as well. So during this last glacier melting, sometime probably within the last 15,000 years or so, it's hypothesized that the northern sunfish and the long ear sunfish, which had mostly been separated in range, had a secondary contact as drainages shifted and connected. And gene flow started happening between the two species as the long ear sunfish began expanding its range. Hence why most all of the specimens in this area are expressing admixed genes and traits, and thus making identifying these specimens a real hassle for us anglers. And recently one of our supporting patrons here at KNFS, Robert Whitworth, was kind enough to go capture some specimens in southeastern Ohio for this video where these specimens clearly have some admixed genes of northern and long ear, which aligns with what this study shows. This specimen shows a lateral patterning and coloring much more like that of a long ear, especially with that blue spotting color and amount. But the ear flap is the big giveaway that it has intermediate features between the two species. It's maybe sitting around a 31 degree angle, which sits right between the typical angle of Lepimus paltastes, the northern sunfish, and Lepimus megalotus, um, the type right in the central part of the range. Also, that red misplaced patch is primarily a northern sunfish feature. So basically, these specimens around Columbus, Cincinnati, and all along this whole range are just admixed specimens to some degree. So as far as the long ear species complex and whether we'll actually officially see these species elevated to that species status, that remains to be seen. 
One of the main obstacles to the potential species elevation, as I see it, is that under one of the analyses this study used, which looks at the GDI, or the genealogical divergence indices, the results produced ambiguous delimitation numbers for the four lineages that aren't currently described as species. So that's kind of like saying, eh, it could be a different species or it couldn't be. And Lepimus megalotus, within the central range there, it doesn't produce strong distinguishing results from the other lineages at all. And those numbers are even when they are excluding possibly genetically admixed specimens from the analyses. The northern sunfish, on the other hand, still seems to be almost a sure thing as a distinct species under the GDI analysis. But I just don't see a bunch of the other ichthyological authorities not hopping on board with this uh, species elevation, especially after under similar conditions, we've recently seen four new species of black basses within the genus Micropterus added to the same family that the Lepimids belong to. But either way, whether we call them a different species or not, it doesn't change the fact that there are some genetic and morphological differences between the populations. It's just evolution in action. And just like we see with the spotted and red spotted sunfishes, the zones of current hybridizations and past introgressions just provide identification nightmares. And even when we are looking at zones that don't hold introgress specimens of long ear, uh, these varying lineages, based on the study's morphological criteria for distinguishing the species apart, there's still a failure rate of more than 10% for each lineage except the northern sunfish, which can be properly distinguished from the complex about 98% of the time. Basically, it's not so simple to tell these long-eared sunfish lineages apart just looking at them unless you're in a definite range of a certain lineage because most all of their features can overlap. And many of these features require looking at very specific uh, meristic and morphometric measurements that most anglers don't want to bother with. It's not like we're comparing uh, green sunfish and a northern sunfish. That's cut and dry easy. There's a reason why this long ear complex has remained as an unresolved complex for so long. And don't even get me started on the long ears in Texas. These populations produce the widest diversity of features I've seen as far as appearance goes out of all species of common sunfishes. So someday in the near future when I've got the gas money, I hope to go dive down the central part of the United States and just capture a whole bunch of these uh, different specimens of these different lineages so I can get great photos and video and uh, better understand their morphological differences so I can present that all to you. But now let's get to the northern sunfish identification tips. Like we mentioned earlier, this is one of the smallest species within the genus Lepimus, typically not exceeding five inches. There are three anal spines like all the common sunfishes with usually nine anal rays, 10 dorsal spines, 10 to 11 dorsal rays, and the pectoral fin usually has 12 to 13 rays. All the other lineages within the long ear species complex are more likely to have 13 or 14 rays. The pectoral fin is more rounded than pointy and typically will not extend past the eye if bent forward. This is a quick feature to examine if you are unsure if you are looking at a pumpkin seed or a northern sunfish. Pumpkin seed have that long pointy pectoral fin that will usually extend past the eye. Also, like we mentioned earlier, a great feature to notice on the northern sunfish is the angle of the opercular flap. Typically, it's more angled than what's on a pumpkin seed. On a northern, it's more likely to be around 38 to 42 degrees. And compared to the other species within the long ear species complex, the northern sunfish most often has the shortest as well as the most angled opercular flap. That opercular flap will also have a nice solid red patch with some light edging on the dorsal and ventral sides. Don't expect this patch to be neat and clean and appear the same on every specimen. Uh, this red patch is also a feature present on the pumpkin seed, the main species that is confused with the northern sunfish besides long ear. With northern sunfish versus pumpkin seed, besides that long pectoral fin we talked about on the pumpkin seed, Notice that the northern sunfish will almost always have more blue iridescence in the median fins, as well as a deeper orange and often a red coloration. Pumpkin seed usually have a brown mottling in the median fins, and sometimes the breeding specimens will have orange in there. 
but it's usually never as dark of an orange as what a northern sunfish will show, and pumpkin seed will never show the red in the median fins. Another key feature to notice on the northern sunfish is the bluish green iridescent spotting along the body. Pumpkin seed have orange to brown spotting along the body that may sit on a bluish green sheen. Northern typically will have a mixed coloring of spotting that may seem like bluish spots and oranges spots and brownish spots, but the bluish spots stand out more, whereas the oranges and brown spots stand out more on a pumpkin seed. Now here is a very cool specimen. This is a hybrid between a northern sunfish and a pumpkin seed caught by Dustin. It has stronger pumpkin seed features than northern features, but here's a few features that give this hybridization away. First off, the pectoral fin does not extend past the eye. Typically, with pumpkin seed, that pectoral fin is going to be a bit past the eye, and northern have that shorter pectoral fin. It's an intermediate feature. Secondly, that mottling in the median fins is a darker orange than what we'd expect on a pumpkin seed. Next, we look at the ear flap. It's much more angled and even a bit longer than the pumpkin seed in this region typically display. It looks intermediate between the two species. Also, let's look at the mouth. Northern will usually have a maxilla that passes the anterior edge of the eye, but usually not too far in. It's nothing like a green sunfish. On pumpkin seed, that maxilla doesn't usually ever pass the interior edge of the eye. This specimen has a mouth more like a northern. So let's look back at those underwater photos uh, of Dustin's. We'll notice that this is a male northern sunfish in breeding colors. All of the colors are deeper, stronger, and more vibrant than they are outside of the breeding season. We see the red and blue in the median fins is strong. The body takes on a darker orange red with brighter blue spotting the top. And what I really love about this photo is that we can see the pelvic fins turn dark during the breeding season. That's something we also see on the males of some other species of lepimids, including uh, long ears and red ear sunfish. With this specimen, we can quickly tell that this is a male during some point in the breeding season. The specimen's colors are vibrant, but not as vibrant as they would be underwater. But we see the dark pelvic fins, the deep yellow orange on the breast and belly, as well as the overall brightness of blue. And here we can see a female caught on the same day. She looks a bit chubby because she's gravid or with eggs. But we see that her colors are much paler than that of the males. She still has a bright red spot on her ear flap though. That is a characteristic both sexes will carry throughout their entire adulthood. And here's a gravid female I caught in Illinois. She mostly has bland colors but we can see that brick orange color in the median fins and blue spotting is still there. Also a nifty trick if you are dealing with lepimids is you can look at the urogenital opening. It's the hole closest to the tail right behind the anus. Her urogenital opening is very swollen. Males usually don't have an opening that is the same size or larger than the anus. That trick works most of the time, uh, but sometimes outside of breeding season you can't really tell and sometimes you just can't tell unless you do a dissection of uh, and look at their gonads. Uh, and even in the breeding season, it can be hard to tell the northern sunfish males apart from the females because some of the northern males take on what is called a sneaker strategy. Or they kind of look like the females because they don't build nests like the parental males that take on the, the vibrant colors and get bigger and engage in the courtship rituals with the females. I'm fairly certain this one in Wisconsin may have been a sneaker male. So usually the lateral line is complete though this species may be about 25% of the time uh, that lateral line will be broken or interrupted and that's something you will rarely see on the other fishes within the long ear species complex which almost always show a complete lateral line. So let's just talk a little bit more on the nightmare of identification uh, as far as it comes to the introgress specimens. So let's just go back to that beautiful specimen I photographed out of the Potomac River caught by my friend Cesar Villacorta. This specimen and all the specimens I've been getting in the strainage have only made sense to me after reading uh, the study last year showing the genetic admixture of the northern and long ear sunfish in the upper Potomac River Basin. This is obviously a male. Bright colors, dark pelvic fins, the works. It's a gorgeous fish. It's not like the typical long ear sunfish lineage we see in the heart of the range of the Mississippi River Basin that show what 
will be the pure Lepimus megalotus uh, lineage. And it's because of that bright red chunk on the ear flap. That's typically only a northern sunfish feature. However, we do see that feature also show up uh, with more frequency in the long ear complex lineage down in the far southeast part of the range of Lepimus solis, uh, like this specimen provided by uh, Ray Wilhite. And I still don't know why these specimens express this trait just yet. But also what I've noticed on many of the specimens caught out of the Potomac River drainage is that the ear flaps are just more slanted than the other fishes of the long ear species complex. This angle of the ear flap is showing an intermediate expression between the long ear and northern. Typically on Lepimus megalotus, what's in the central part of range, we see an angle that's around 20 to 24 degrees, give or take some degrees. And on northern sunfish, like I mentioned, that angle is often more between 38 and 42 degrees give or take. And so not all the specimens in the tonal drainage have this red patch on the opercular flap and sometimes the angles are all over the place but they also don't seem to approach those larger sizes of what the long ear do in the central part of the range. So I think for simplicity right now it would just make sense to keep considering this population of genetic mutts in the Potomac River Basin as long ear sunfish. Even though we know there's northern blood involved. And who knows, maybe in another few hundred thousand years this species in the Potomac will evolve into a completely new species. We, we definitely won't be around to see that happen. Oh, and just to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, the specimens in the Potomac River Basin might even have a smidgen of another Lepimus lineage in there, Lepimus solis. Speaking of which, that big Lepimus megalotus study found an isolated population all the way down in Louisiana at Lake Providence that is a genetic admixture of the northern sunfish Lepimus peltastes and the Lepimus aquilensis lineage that we find in Texas. And I couldn't find any reliable specimen photos to show you on that though. They also found the same genetic admixture in the uh, Hatchie River drainage in Tennessee. So it's all a complicated craziness when it comes to common sunfishes but I hope that I cleared up some things for you uh, even with genetic analysis, sometimes we are just left puzzled. So, thank you for watching. Fish responsibly, and uh, good luck.